Hey everyone, welcome back to The Lookout. I was going through some footage and um, found a project that I'd started last fall and that um, kind of fell by the wayside, but I did an interview with a guy named Brett Forrest, who's a TV reporter out of Reno. I think he's working out of Las Vegas now, but uh, he did a story about the Dixie Fire and about fire costs, and we got together in the woods to talk about his story, and then afterwards I did a quick interview with him and asked him some questions. We talked a little bit just about how the... Um, mainstream media covers wildfire and uh, thought it was a good conversation just about um, you know how we can move beyond kind of the sensational and fear-based reporting that we tend to get and um, improve the quality of the information that's getting to the public so here we go Brett Forrest recorded in the Dixie Fire uh, fall of 2021 well welcome to the lookout uh, how long have you been reporting so I just actually wrapped up my first official year as a reporter. I transitioned into the industry a little late, got my master's a couple of years ago, and this is my first full-time reporting job All right. um, out here in Reno, Northern Nevada, Eastern Sierra area. Uh -huh. um, so so um, did you get any sort of mentorship in wildfire reporting or did they just kind of throw you into it? So, you know, I grew up in Colorado. I'm no stranger to wildfires, but as far as covering, reporting them, knowing what I'm talking about, I was pretty much thrown into it. Um, Mid-June of this year, 2021, uh, Jack's Valley fire happened in Carson City. Not too big of a fire, but it was a pretty early fire for the season. And it just tore through some dry sagebrush and right near homes, buildings in Carson City. And so I got sent to cover that. My photographer and I ended up right next to the flames, which he loved. For me, you know, we, we do get the gear and everything. I was wearing the gear, uh -huh. but that's the first time wearing it. I'm standing here reporting like you're the camera and there's, I don't know, 10, 20 yards behind me are just 15, 20 foot flames. Uh -huh. So on TV, it's good. But to me, I'm just like, I, I didn't know what to say. So I just, you know, I just start saying what I'm seeing, where I am, describing the scene. And that's kind of how I just started my season of wildfire reporting. And then uh, from there, it escalated into all the massive wildfires we saw in the Sierra. Uh -huh. Would you find it helpful if someone, if there was like training for media to help you learn the lingo? And you know, do you think that's something that the industry should support as far as giving people uh, kind of some basic understanding of how fire works and fire suppression? Yeah, I think because a lot of people are getting their fire news from people like me mm -hmm. and people like me should know what we're talking about. So yes, I think we should have training. And I will say my, my news station did send us through um, a three hour is two or three hour session so obviously probably not long enough but we did have a three hour session with truckee meadows fire district in uh, reno and they kind of walked us through safety issues they told us how to use the um I'm trying to blank on the name the covers the fire, shelter. the fire shelters so we we got issued those and we were taught how to use those worst case scenario i hope i never end up in that situation uh, they taught us kind of containment um, suppression terms like that mm -hmm. um, you know but a lot of times you, you just have a three-hour training and then you get thrown into it right you kind of sometimes forget it in instantly um, so what were some questions you know when you deal with public information officers on fires like were there questions you asked that they wouldn't answer that you weren't satisfied with what you got back from them you know all the time because PIOs nature of their job they want to make their agency look good uh -huh. which makes sense you know, media spin, you hear that all the time. They're giving their spin for, you know, whether it's Cal Fire or, you know, local fire agency. You'll ask some questions, you know, like Dixie Fire, I'd talk to these PIOs on a weekly basis and obviously things didn't look good for a while, uh -huh. for several months. And every time you ask about it, they always turn it into a positive spin somehow. Mm -hmm. And I, I was always just thinking to myself, this doesn't seem positive that it's, you know, grew to 900,000 acres. I remember the first PIO I spoke to, I was looking at a map, I was like, you know, this fire looks like it could grow to the National Park, Lassen National Park. It looks like it could go to where the Beckworth fire burned. And I mentioned that, you know, at the time I didn't know it actually would. Uh -huh. And they were like, no, no, that's not going to happen. You know, we're, we'll get this controlled and contained. And, you know, then a month or two later, that stuff did happen. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm always, I was always asking questions like that, but they would never give it a negative spin, which mm -hmm. makes sense in a way, but you know, it's, well, it's not necessarily the, painting the real picture. I think it's one of the problems we have because we've spent so long kind of sugarcoating things for the public that, that when things don't go well, they somehow think it's like a conspiracy theory or something, you know, that like if we really wanted to put out the Dixie fire, we could have. Mm -hmm. 
And, uh, you know, I've been on some fires where the fire's pretty much out and we're out there, we can barely find a smoke. And the, the local news channel is still playing pictures of big flames from like two days before mm -hmm. because we've only called the fire 50% contained. Mm -hmm. So they'll say, oh, fire's only 50% contained, still raging. And we're out there and it's out, you know? And so, you know, is there pressure kind of coming from your editors and other people to kind of keep feeding a sensational story? Yes and no. I mean, a lot of times, because TV journalists, especially each medium of journalism will deal with it differently, but we are the visual medium. Mm -hmm. So we have to show the visuals. And so sometimes if there's no more fire to show, that's fine. You know, I'll do my live report in this spot like here. And honestly, to the editor or director, it's, hey, that looks boring. But then, you know, the live report, hey, maybe it might be boring, but then they'll always cut back to the video of the flames of when they were big, of the big flames that we filmed because it's just more visually stimulating, more interesting. And yeah, it does maybe paint the picture that it's worse than it is, or, you know, this is what fires are, kind of scares people to see flames that big. Yeah, um, one comment I got a lot during my coverage of the Caldor fire was just that people were thanking me for this calm, mm -hmm. kind of not fear-based approach. And I wonder sometimes, um, you know, we do a lot to stoke people's fear of fire. And I feel like that's one of our big problems with um, where the public's at with fire now is that they don't get to see enough small fire. Mm -hmm. You know, they have this impression that every fire is a Dixie fire that's raging and killing everything. And so my personal ask to you is that you'll show some more pictures of small flames mm -hmm. and um, try to highlight a little the, the good things that happen during fires, you know, the lower severity, the, the, there's that nuance. And I think it's really important for us to get the public to see all the different faces of fire, and mm -hmm. that it's not just destructive. Yeah, and that's a fair point. And you know, like I said, I, I'm still, this is my first wildfire season reporting, and I'm well aware there's so much more for me to learn and tell. And you know, a lot of it's word choice saying, you know, ravaging the landscape, apocalyptic landscape. Right, you know, language is so important. Yeah, and you know, maybe the spot I'm at looks like that, but then as you have taught me, there's good fires and you know, maybe it does look apocalyptic, but maybe it's also in a good way. And mm -hmm. so yeah, word choice is, is key and you know, stoking the fears, it's, it's not what we try to do, but you know, it, it never really happens, especially when we're showing those big flames. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I'll say personally, you know, there were times where I actually was scared because this is my first season covering and I'd be in a spot I probably shouldn't have been with the California laws allowing media to get so close and just feeling and seeing and hearing the fire. I never have heard fire before. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I, there were times I was scared and I probably conveyed that when I'm reporting. And so, yeah, it's a self uh, perpetuating, you know, thing. It's just. I'm scared, so maybe I convey that and then makes other people scared to fire. And, you know, at this point, you know, I'm not as scared. I, I, I know how to handle I know how to be smart about it. But definitely at the start of fire season, it was right. a little risky. Figure out to park the car. Yeah. Yeah. So what about this piece you're working on right now? Can you talk about that on camera? Yeah. So I'm working on a, uh, a longer form in-depth package. package. Uh, a package is a news lingo. I'll, I'll start that over. So I'm working on a longer form in-depth story just about the cost of wildfires, the cost of suppression. And that's both financial, but then through the conversation I had with you, it's also, it's social, it's emotional, it's mental. There's so much more to the cost than just the finances, but the finances are huge, especially Cal Fire spending over a billion dollars in suppression efforts now. So you take that, which is part of the story, but then you broaden it out to the other costs involved and just how uh, the policies we're, we're enacting right now might be contributing to it. And so, you know, it's, it, it was an eye opening conversation with you. And I, I was glad to cover the other side of it because it's not just finances. There's so much more to the cost of suppression. Yeah. yeah all the impacts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you taking some interest in learning more about the, the issues. And, you know, I think firefighting is really a storytelling culture. You know, it's how we communicate our culture with, within the um, within the fire business. And we've got this um, kind of big thumb that pushes down on us that tells us, oh, you can't talk to the media without going through a PIO. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's really important for us to seek out um, the people that are willing to talk who aren't um, getting throttled by the propagandists. Yeah. And so I think the more that you guys can um, get to know some firefighters and ask them what's going on, mm -hmm. you know, um, the, the propaganda is not serving um, our kind of larger better understanding of fire. Mm -hmm. 
And yeah, I'll say I have nothing against PIOs. They're always very helpful and knowledgeable, but yeah, they do put that positive spin on it. And there are stories this year, especially with the Caldor fire, I sought out actual firefighters, got their perspective, and they gave so much more honest answers and it's refreshing and it's, it's different rather than every day just hearing the same, you know, this is the percent containment we're at, this is the acres burned we're at, these are the fire lines we're building. To some people that's interesting, but you know, you also want to tell the stories of the people and what they're actually seeing and witnessing. And so I think yeah. towards the end of the fire season, especially with the Caldor, we did a better job with that. But yeah, you, you have to find those people. You have to not just go straight to the PIOs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a lot of things, like there's a lot to talk about there just in that like percent containment is really a political number. You know, mm -hmm. it, it oftentimes has little to do with how secure the fire really is. Mm -hmm. And lots to learn about it. Yeah, that's something I, I learned this year myself, <laughs> especially with the Dixie. They'd always say, we got this contained here, they would jump the line. It's like, okay, well then why did we report that in the first place? And mm -hmm. so there's so much more to it. And mm -hmm. a lot of nuance, a lot to learn. And, you know, I'm just one fire reporter. We got plenty more who we all need to do a better job. But I also will say all my colleagues, you know, we did get better through the year. And yeah, we take constructive criticism because we know, you know, it's, we aren't wildland firefighters. We, we need to learn more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, appreciate your work. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. All right. Cool. Right on. That was great. Thanks. Yeah, no problem.